really, really happy to be here today with Dr. Wolfgang Smith and also with Dr. Richard Smith. No, no relationship, I guess, but, uh, but uh, Dr. Wolfgang Smith is the author of this wonderful book, The Vertical Ascent, and also Ancient Wisdom and Modern Misconceptions, along with many other wonderful books. But these are the two that I've been working on. And uh, Dr. Richard Smith, you are the the um, the, the head of the president of Dr. Wolfgang Smith's foundation. And uh, Dr. Wolfgang Smith, perhaps you could just tell me for a, a minute or two what it is that your foundation is all about. Well, in a sense, it is about understanding science and uh, not only what science has to offer, but how it is presently misunderstood and thus misleading humanity. This is something that I have been very concerned about for a long time, that in the name of science, we're being uh, led into very, very serious errors, which have implications in all aspects of life. I distinguish sharply between what I call scientism and science. Science is the real thing. Scientism claims to be science, but is really ideology driven. And so in a sense, uh, I am interested in uh, making our society more wary of scientism and by the same token, open again to the great wisdom of mankind. I do not believe that the ancients were all uh, intellectually inferior to us. On the contrary, I think it's to a large extent the other way around. And so I'm interested in uh, re-establishing to the extent that it is possible, some of the ancient wisdom of mankind. So that's about a rough summary of what we're trying to accomplish. And your foundation is called the Philosophia Foundation? Is that correct? Philo as Philosophia Initiative Foundation. It's a okay. complete title, yes. Philosophia Initiative Foundation. And it's a wonderful resource, all kinds of uh, ma marvelous material that you have on there. Uh, many chapters from quite a few of your books and articles that are written um, very frequently. So it's a one, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes um, so that folks can have access to that. And uh, I wonder if you could just show that slide with the, the, the picture from the front frontispiece of the book, the vertical ascent. Yes. Um, <clears throat> In your book, The Vertical Ascent, you talk about this picture of the cosmos as having the center and then the, uh, there we go, the center and then the, the margin, the, the perimeter of the circle. And one of my questions is, could we look at this from a 3D perspective and see the center as being the pinnacle? Uh, well, I. I classify it as an icon. And an icon, of course, is a way of presenting uh, metaphysical truth in a very simple, uh, abbreviated visual form. So uh, I think we should keep it two dimensional and uh, try to understand the ontology which it expresses. I, I have a sense that this icon was really known in ancient times. I have a feeling that, for example, the students in Plato's Academy were somehow acquainted with that icon. Uh, it was never written down so far as I know, but uh, it's, I don't consider it an invention. I, I consider it an icon that is simply there and very helpful if we try to understand the 
uh, ultimate ontology of the cosmos because the cosmos has three parts, a center, an intermediary realm, and a, and a circumference. And all the world that we know through our ordinary life, our five senses, is just that circumference. There's this vast intermediary realm that we normally do not experience. And then there is a center which also we normally experience only in a very, very partial way. So it's a symbolic representation of the integral cosmos, which is tripartite. And the, the easiest way to explain why it is tripartite is because man himself is tripartite. Corpus anima spiritus are the Latin words. And so just as we are tripartite, so is the cosmos. And the, uh, the intermediary would be the, the um, how, how would you describe the intermediary? Well, uh, the intermediary is a realm that is subject to the condition of time, but not of space. And in, ancient, in the ancient world, that intermediary realm was uh, fairly well known to the, uh, the great philosophers and spiritual figures, but the knowledge of this intermediary domain has almost completely vanished in the Western world. When I traveled long ago in India, I noticed that every educated Hindu in conversation, you could speak with him about the so-called Tribhuvana. Well, that's a Sanskrit word, but it means the triple world. So in India, even just a, an educated businessman will talk to you about the Tribhuvana because it is there in that tradition. In the West, there is almost no knowledge of it at all. In the Orthodox Church, there is a certain reference to what they call the aerial world. So they recognize it. They recognize that it's a dangerous place uh, because believe it or not, demons are this not a medieval superstition. It's a reality, they are there, unfortunately. And that is their native realm, so to speak. Could I ask a kind of a controversial question? <laughs> There's an awful lot of talk nowadays about using psychedelics to, um, to interrogate the spiritual world. It, when people take psychedelics, do you think that they somehow access this intermediary realm? Absolutely. I have no doubt about it. And all I can say is, it's a terribly, terribly dangerous thing to do uh, because it's real and the entities that inhabit it are also real. I, I will mention in passing that uh, at one point I met um, Father Malachi Martin, the famous author and exorcist on a radio program and somehow the conversation turned to the intermediary realm. And when I said that he knew all about it, he says, yes, I call it the middle plateau because that's where you do the exorcism. You, you actually communicate with the demonic world from the intermediary realm. So he knew how to access that realm and had done it many, many times in, in his exorcisms. So, so the, um, one of the things that fascinates me about this icon is that this idea of the center, because when you look at, um, well, I'm an artist. So part of the reason I got interested in all this is from the standpoint of art, um, boundaries are very, very important. 
because um, one of the things that generates creativity in art is having very specific boundaries for yourself. You know, it's the old saw, necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> But if you have tight constraints, then you have to work within those constraints to become more creative. And that led me to this whole idea in uh, biology that one of the things that distinguishes life from non-life is that life has this ability to keep from dispersing. It moves towards the center and that's why it doesn't disperse outwards. Everything moves towards the center. So in a cell, it's the center that holds the cell together. And in the cosmos, it's the center that holds the cosmos together. At least that's the way it looks to me. So I wonder if that fits with, with your uh, ontology. Absolutely. Basically, my ontology is nothing but Platonism. And uh, so... Uh, Aristotle himself was a Platonist, so I'm in... In the Greek tradition, I, uh, but I think this is universal. I've made a rather thorough study in my young years of the Vedic tradition, the tradition which was still alive in India when I traveled there half a century ago. And that was basically the same wisdom as you found in Platonism. Um, the point about that center is it. Uh, it is really and truly the center of the of the cosmos, because the reality of all real things is right there in that center. It is what, in the Western language, we might call the eternal world. There's neither time nor space there, and yet the reality of all real things is actually there beyond space and time. And I would add, Karen, like this icon does really um, express something that truly differentiates Wolfgang's work from almost anybody else's work that you're going to encounter, particularly in the secular world and even in most of the Christian world, which is this idea of hierarchy and levels of being and ontology. So most everything that anybody talks about today is all on the circumference of that circle. And this is where physics operates on the circumference of the circle. So, and, and physics would deny that the intermediary world or the eternal world exists because they don't those worlds um, cannot be expressed in terms of time and space, which is the language of physics, right? Physics is, you know, uh, x1, x2, x3, where are you in space and what time is it, right? <laughs> Let's take a measurement, right? All that happens on the circumference of the circle. So the vast majority of our being and of the cosmos is completely disregarded by physics and by most of the world today. And so uh, this icon is, is very critical to understand how Wolfgang's work is different um, from uh, most everything else, which is pretty much even, you know, even people who are talking about spiritual themes in kind of a secular context, it's still all on the circumference of that circle and really not, um, uh, acknowledging the existence of these other um, ontological domains. Well, so in, in the vertical ascent, um, which this is, that's one of the things this image comes from, it talks about um, the vertical holds primacy, um, whereas the horizontal operates laboriously, one might say, by way of a temporal progression through space. The fact is that vertical causality derives from wholeness, whereas the horizontal derives from parts. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the difference between wholeness and parts and how that works out across all of um, 
not only physics, but across that whole picture of your iconic tripartite cosmos? Well, first of all, I think it, we, we need to realize that physics and modern science in general, by its very modus operandi, its intrinsic methodology, deals uh, incurably with, um, with parts. In other words, it can conceive of a whole only as a sum of parts. And so the causality which, uh, with which physics operates is a causality emanating from the parts. And you can't say acting upon wholes because physics really has no, con no ontological conception of wholeness. The only wholeness physicists deal with is a, uh, is a sum of parts. So physics is based upon atomization. And it turns out, however, that uh, wholeness does play an absolutely essential role in the economy of life, whether the physicists know about it or not. And along with the idea of wholes, there is a corresponding causality, which I call vertical causality as opposed to horizontal causality. And I first introduced this idea of vertical causality in the context of physics. The new physics came in in 1926, quantum theory, and uh, very soon physicists realized that there's something very puzzling about quantum theory because a quantum system in its own right is a very, very uh, strange, bizarre uh, uh, thing. I mean, for example, if you have a quantum particle, it will not be located in general in any particular point in space. In fact, there's a probability that it is in given any two regions in space, there's a certain probability that the particle is in that region. So these quantum particles are very, very uh, strange uh, entities. You, you can't really conceive of them except in mathematical terms. But what puzzled physicists is that when they make a measurement in an instant, as it were, this particle, uh, instead of being spread out over vast regions of space, obtains a particular position. The measured particle is in a given place and time. And so this is something that puzzles the physicists. How is it possible for an act of measurement to collapse this probability wave and give a definite position to particles which have no definite positions before the act of measurement? And believe it or not, physicists have been kicking this so-called measurement problem around for a good hundred years, almost, <laughs> it's more like 90. For about 90 years, they've been speculating on this with no actual solution in sight. The weirdest ideas are presented by them uh, in order to resolve this conundrum but uh, I believe it's still open an open question in the physics world. So this is what got me into thinking about quantum mechanics. And I came to a very simple conclusion. The, the reason measurement is not comprehensible to the physicist is that the measuring instrument itself is not 
really a physical thing. It is not the kind of thing that the physicist studies or, or describes in his equations. It is what I call a corporeal entity. So there is a difference between a corporeal entity and a physical ob an object. And the difference basically is that the corporeal entity is perceptible. If you think of uh, visual perception, it has color, it has qualities, uh, and we perceive it. So I realized that what had happened is that the physicist had abstracted from the perceivable world. The perceivable world is real, it's not an imagination. The red apple is there and it's red and we perceive it. But to the physicist, the red apple has become a res cogitans, a thing of the mind. So what happened is that in the 17th century, Western civilization became, as it were, controlled by one philosopher, René Descartes, uh, he introduced a very actually weird philosophy and uh, it gained traction. It became the philosophy which scientists and especially of course physicists absorb as it were without knowing that it is a philosophy. They think it's just the way it is. And uh, so I realized that the reason that this measurement problem continues to mystify physicists to the present day, and you should see some of the theories they evolve in order to explain it, it's, uh, it, it becomes really weird. And the reason that the physicist can't resolve that problem is that uh, he has fallen victim to this Cartesian philosophy and in the Cartesian philosophy, uh, there are no corporeal entities because all qualities are relegated to the mind. <clears throat> so Descartes, as it were, he cut the world into two parts, res extense, extended entities on one side, and all they are is they are quantities, they are, they are, so to speak, the world as a physicist conceives of it. That's on the outside. And everything else, everything that's not a res extensa was, as it were, postulated to be a res cogitans, so a thing of the mind, a thing of thought. So René Descartes cut the world into these two pieces. And this has become, so to speak, the underlying philosophy, which everybody who goes into physics absorbs unknowingly. And it is really unknowingly because I find that when I try to explain what Alfred North White then called bifurcation, this cutting of reality into two pieces, the mechanical and quantitative, and the rest is all supposed to be mental. Uh, to the physicist, this is not a theory, this is the way things are. And when you try to explain it to him, he doesn't really understand it because uh, he doesn't know any other way of, of, of uh, conceiving the world. So what I'm saying is that in Western civilization, the intellectual class has uh, typically been victimized by this Cartesian philosophy. They accept this, not as a philosophy, but as simply the way things are. And uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very tragic thing because first of all, it makes life tragic, just think. Uh, when a father or mother uh, uh, holds a child, according to Descartes, 
they are holding a race extensor. All that there is outside in space and time is a mechanism. It's a terribly tragic way of looking at life. And of course, I fully believe that it is false. But I'm, the point that I'm, that I'm making is that the world of science has been duped by this bifurcationist Cartesian philosophy. So they think of the world as greatly reduced. And uh, what I uh, marveled when I began thinking about the so-called measurement problem is this, that as soon as you uh, step out of this Cartesian way of looking at the world, the solution of the measuring problem is very, very simple, childishly simple, because the measuring instrument is corporeal. That means it is perceptible, it owns qualities. You can see it, you can touch it, uh, you can hear it um, give sound. Incidentally, if it weren't perceptible, it couldn't measure anything because measurement is a matter of seeing, say, a number on a screen. So, uh, what has happened is that our men of science and especially men of physics uh, have been duped by a philosophy which uh, is totally imaginary, it is totally off course. And incidentally, the interesting thing is that in essence, this Cartesian philosophy was enunciated long, long by a pre-Socratic known as uh, Democritus. Democritus, yes. <clears throat> so Democritus, before Plato, <laughs> pre-Socratic said that all the people vulgarly think there's the sweet and the bitter. In other words, there's a perceptible but in reality, only atoms and the void. So this is the philosophy which the Platonist and Aristotelian schools completely disproved, disqualified. They were Rejected. smart enough to recognize <clears throat> that this is just a fantasy, but it is this very same philosophy of... Uh, Democritus. Democritus, thank you same philosophy that emerged again in the 17th century uh, through René Descartes. And well, it could, we, could, we, could we take a look at this, uh, what you were saying about the measurement, the, uh, the measuring equipment being perceptible. Um, I think what you're saying is that it is not a quantum mechanical measuring system. Therefore, you're working in two realms. You have the you have the quantum realm, but then the measuring system is in another realm. Yeah. It's a level up, right? And and then not only that, but the measuring equipment has been designed, and that's a level up. And then it's being utilized by that level, which is a level up from that. So so just by virtue of the 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 whole system of measuring you can see that there is a hierarchy it's not flat right is that Absolutely. is that partly what you're saying you, you've got the point perfectly and you've expressed it perfectly exactly um, the cosmos is hierarchic it breaks up into different levels and the corporeal level is actually the lowest level in the integral cosmos. It is what is represented by the boundary of that circle. That's where the cosmos comes to an end. And uh, however, the physicist uh, abstracts from that. He does not recognize the corporeal world for what it is. Namely, it's a sensible world, the world we perceive through our five senses. But he abstracts the quantitative part of that. So this is uh, the effect of Cartesian, of the Cartesian philosophy. 
the physicist is blinded by the Cartesian philosophy. He does not recognize the corporeal for what it is. And uh, so he has lost the whole idea of hierarchy and he tries to build the world out of these quantitative entities that he has defined by his physics itself defines these entities. And so they are not what the world is made of. It's, you know, Wolfgang's um, domain is physics, but it's very graphic in biology, right? It's the same principle of life yeah. as a vertical cause on the living organism, right? And the analogy of the physicist and their abstraction process, right? Versus a biologist who's going to literally like, you know, kill something and try to analyze its parts and figure out how to put the parts back together and make it alive again. And it's not possible. Right? And in science today, you hear all kinds of conversation about emergence, right? And emergent properties, right? Yeah. Like artificial intelligence. And I worked in artificial intelligence for years. This was part of what my PhD was in. And I studied at the Santa Fe Institute. I studied complexity science. I was involved in the field of so-called artificial life. How do we create the right, you know, um, algorithms and conditions in a computer with metabolic tax and growth and reproduction and look for emergent properties, right? And then this whole thesis today in the world about artificial intelligence and technology that where this is an emergent intelligence is all, you know, coming out of this philosophy that says, let's get rid of the most important things, <laughs> you know, <laughs> go down to this level of abstraction and then try to recreate all the most important things. And that is what we fundamentally reject. And that's this idea of wholeness and parts, which is what you originally asked about and mm -hmm. vertical causation, right? It's actually consciousness and life and corporeality that affects the lower realms. And it's not the other way around. You cannot reduce, you cannot abstract and reduce your way back to creation and to life. And that is the fundamental error of science, scientists, scientism, scientism, scientism. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to get these words all mixed up, right? You know, through the enlightenment and then to today, right? And you see it in, in our world today and these technology companies, you know, that basically are trying to say, hey, we got everything under control. You know, we'll take care of you. You can have your universal basic income. We'll make all the important decisions with our emergent intelligence that's greater than, you know, our God-given intelligence. So this is, you know, the kind of worldview that, as Wolfgang, you know, says, goes all the way back to Democritus, uh, through Descartes, Galileo, Kant, um, and a lot of Descartes' ideas were, um, let's just say, they were modified, <laughs> you know, by um, <clears throat> later thinkers who kind of uh, misconstrued some of what Descartes originally said himself. Well, and we, I mean, we certainly see the effects all around us with the nihilism and the depression and the anxiety that's yes. overtaken young people because it's an of inhumane loss, culture. Yes, a loss of meaning. And um, um, one of the one of the quotes that. Um, Wolfgang brought up in the vertical ascent is from a, a philosopher named Jean Borella. And oh, I yeah. thought this was just excellent that appearance is the image and revelation of being. It, it conceals this only if we idolize it, attributing to it a reality for which it is unsuited. So we've talked on my channel quite a lot in the past about the difference between an icon and an idol that an icon is something that you can look into deeply and see beyond it, but an idol is when you take it for itself and then begin to begin to worship it. But you said you, the quote here is that appearance is the image and revelation of being. And I mentioned to you earlier, um, 
Jonathan Pajot, the Eastern Orthodox thinker, he's always talking about wholeness in terms of, if you take, for example, a chair, a chair in essence has many parts, but we don't look at it as the parts, we see only the whole. We see the whole, um, <clears throat> there's something that, that we are attributing to it that gives it this wholeness. And part of that may be what that we see it as something to sit in, but also it's made up of all, you know, this physicist would tell us it's made up of all these particles. It's made up of all the molecules and all the elements that are in it. And it's made up of uh, arms and, and legs and a seat and, and, and nails and whatever all else goes into making a chair. And yet when we look at it, we see it as a whole which is not too different than looking at an apple and seeing an apple as a whole thing that has color and taste and, and seeds within it that are going to sprout and become a tree and make more apples. And we, we have the capacity to conceive it as a whole. And that very thing about how we, how we give something identity, that is a very mysterious thing. But, but you have said here that appearance is the image and revelation of being. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit more. <clears throat> well, let me first of all say, I'm glad you mentioned um, Jean Borella. He is perhaps the deepest metaphysician of the 20th century. And I, I say this advisedly. And he has grasped the uh, metaphysics of Plato and the metaphysics of the great uh, Christian metaphysicians. He has grasped this perhaps more deeply than anyone else. And I have been, I have profited from Jean Borella. Uh, he has helped me greatly to understand certain things. But getting back to wholeness, the fact of the matter is that even ordinary things such as a chair, as you say, receives its wholeness from the center of that icon. This is something mind boggling because when we speak of this eternal realm, the realm of platonic ideas, what have you, it sounds so mystical, so mysterious, which it is, granted that, but it is also a fact that uh, the everyday things that we know and deal with in our ordinary life receive their actual reality from that central point, that eternal realm, uh, call it whatever you will. And this is something that is in principle inaccessible to the physicist. A physicist, if I were talking now to a physicist, he might well say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because as a physicist, he, one cannot conceive of that wholeness. Because the way the physicist understands anything that he thinks he understands, the way he understands is by decomposing something into parts, ultimately they are sort of atomic parts. But this, even in classical physics, the, the, the modus operandi of physics is based upon cutting things up into little pieces. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much actual empirical knowledge you can get that way. I mean, all of our technology is based upon it. So I'm, I'm not saying that there is an invalidity here. No, there's not an invalidity. There is just a limitation. There are things that can be understood that way, but they are, there are also other things which actually are of prime importance that cannot. So wholeness precedes parts. And the, the cosmos is not just an assembly of, of entities, it is a hierarchy. There's a verticality. 
there's a vertical order which uh, we humans should understand because there is that vertical order in ourselves. We have the corporeal nature, we have the psychic nature, and above the psychic, we, we have a spiritual nature, call it what you will. It is precisely in the arts that this wholeness plays a key role. Uh, I have often in my writing and trying to explain these things to, uh, to a general audience, referred to music especially to indicate the integral wholeness of a mu musical composition. Uh, it's, it's not just an assembly of notes, there's a wholeness there. And I often quote to people something that Mozart said, Mozart confided once to a friend that an entire symphony comes into my mind all at once as one thing. And then it may take him weeks and weeks to unpack it into the scores for the different instruments and so on, and the different movements. But the point is that a real symphony, uh, say, is more than the parts, more than the notes. And uh, this is, of course, why it's beautiful and why we uh, sense very deep meaning in it. But the point is that this wholeness precedes the division. So the point is not only that the physicist cannot understand everything, but the point is that what he can understand is, so to speak, the bottom of things. And this has, of course, has had a tremendous cultural impact upon the contemporary Western civilization because the dominant force in contemporary Western civilization is science, and the basic science is physics. So the fact that uh, the fact is that modern Western culture has, as it were, uh, eliminated all the higher levels of being, and uh, I mean we've become sort of uh, creatures of the mud. We're crawling around on the earth thinking that's all there is. So the blessed thing about modern physics is that nobody really believes it. I'm sure that no parent, uh, when it uh, holds its child, thinks that it's holding a bunch of molecules. I mean, not even the physicists go that far. But yet, in a sense, that would be the logical consequence. So the reason uh, we founded this foundation, Philosophia Initiative Foundation, is because we recognize that this reductionism of contemporary science is uh, not only wrong, but it is uh, dangerous. It is destructive of all higher culture. I mean, uh, it, it, it really shows the resilience of mankind that it has been able to withstand that absolutely poisonous philosophy coming in the name of science and still retain its humanity with, with all the, the limitations that we see daily. We are still human beings and that's, that's a marvel because if we would fully believe what quote unquote science tells us these days, we would be ipso facto dehumanized. So you see uh, what we have to say and what we want to distribute uh, far and wide is uh, not only a, a philosophy of physics, which has technical things to say, but we're interested in the cultural implications and it's nothing short of turning the world right side up again. We're living in, a, in, a, in an upside down world. Well, I, I really enjoy all of your work and what you're trying to do through the foundation and, uh, 
and applaud it. And I, I also noticed that in the, in the book, Ancient Wisdom, you um, were talking about some of the issues that had been coming up in the biological realm in terms of evolutionary theory. And then you mentioned William Dembski's um, work on complex specified information and Michael yes. Fahey's idea of um, irreducible complexity. But then you said something that I thought was just amazing because you zoned right in on one of the danger points in this whole thing. And that is that you said that you were explaining why intelligent design is a dangerous idea. And um, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit because intelligent design one would think that that is telling is saying something about vertical causation and that we believe that there is a designer and that all of this beauty and complexity comes from someplace outside of us but at the same time it also kind of puts us back squarely into the realm of the physicist again if we rely on intelligent design so um i wondered if you might want to say something about that it's well, in, uh, chapter nine, I think, of uh, ancient wisdom. I think Wolfgang, what Karen is speaking to is kind of the Dembski theorem versus the generalized Dembski theorem, right? And how the Dembski theorem, as it is presented, focuses, you know, on mathematics and on information theory, and it kind of reduces everything to the level of information theory. Whereas clearly that's not what your philosophy uh, would say. Well, one, uh, if I could just quote here, he says the, the intelligent design movement threatens to plunge us into an error worse than Darwinism. Whereas design theory has de facto disqualified the Darwinian mechanism, it has in no way discredited the Darwinist concept of common descent which thus remains entrenched as a scientist dogma. And common descent obviates metaphysics in a domain which happens to be incurably metaphysical. Um, I just thought it was a marvelous argument. And um, I mean, maybe it's too complex to get into here, but he says it only compounds bad science with heretical theology. For authentic evolution is indeed an unfolding. Wherever there is an outside, there also has to be an inside. And in the picture that you gave is, um, we could think of the center of that icon as being everything. And then as it unfolds out, it becomes the circle. What's unfolding out are all those infinite axes all folded into that center that can then unfold. Um, because we tend to see only the outside and not the inside, but an inside must always precede an outside. Yeah, you raise very interesting questions here. Uh, first of all, let me say that I was very happy when Bill Dembski's book came out in 1998. I had written my book, The Quantum Enigma, in 1995. So, and in 1995, when I wrote The Quantum Enigma, I showed that the measurement problem cannot be resolved on the basis of horizontal causality, the causality known to the physicist, that in order to, quote unquote, collapse a wave function, you need a different kind of causality which I call vertical and which acts instantaneously. So this is what happened in 1995. In 1998, when Bill Dembski came out with his book, uh, he, it turns out that he rediscovered uh, what I call vertical causality from an information theoretic point of view. And he proved that you cannot produce complex specified information by means of the causality known to the physicist, by means of what I call 
uh, horizontal causality. So in, in that sense, Dembski's work is a partial verification of what I said three years earlier in the quantum enigma. But now uh, getting back to the um, intelligent design movement, which came out of that rediscovery of vertical causality. Um, I, I have problems with it because uh, instead of denying the idea of evolution, which is upside down, things, evolution says things come from the circumference of the circle and uh, all the world's great philosophy and theology says just the opposite, things come from the center. So there is this inversion and uh, instead of correcting that inversion, they simply say, yes, evolution is a fact, but it requires uh, a different kind of causality. And uh, so this is unfortunate. They've missed a great opportunity to uh, help uh, straighten out our civilization. They're not doing that. But uh, it is a partial verification of what I arrived at in completely different ways. And then I should say one thing further. Uh, a few years later, or quite a few years later, in fact, it was in the year, it was about three years ago, I discovered that Dembski's theorem, which is closed in the language of information theorem theory, is just a very, very special case of something incomparably more general. And it is very, very simple. The idea of vertical causation is as it were paired with another ontologic idea. And that is the idea of an irreducible wholeness. And once you have these two ideas together, vertical causation, irreducible wholeness, you uh, can intellectually prove a number of very basic, I call them axioms, call them facts. And one of these ontological facts is this, that you cannot, it, it takes vertical causation to produce irreducible wholeness. So the, the horizontal causation, the causation known to physics cannot produce irreducible wholeness. And so Bill Dembski's theorem is just a very, very special case of this basic ontological theorem. And uh, Dembski closed all his theory in terms of the concept of information theory. Well, that's a very interesting mathematical theory, but the point is that the real Dembski theorem is much more general. And it is what I found years later, which simply says that horizontal causality cannot produce irreducible wholeness. Irreducible wholeness can only be generated by vertical causality. So that's the true Je Dembski theorem. I love that. Um, I've had a number of conversations with a young man who's a, a data compression analyst. And uh, we've talked quite a lot about how something, some icons have the um, kind of are the same image as a, as a very, very strong data compression. I mean, you can think of, uh, you can think of a sperm as an amazing data compression because there's so much packed into that sperm that then opens up in a seed is the same way. It's a very strong data compression. And all of those things are irreducible wholeness. And so they're, they're filled with everything that can just spring forth from that. And 
when we think about the first chapter of the book of John, in the beginning was the word. The word is the ultimate data compression of all time, except it's more than just data. It, it's the compression of everything. And then that it's, it's like a, the ultimate zip drive. You touch it and it opens up. And uh, I think it also speaks to the idea of levels, then, right? Because the yes. idea of data compression is that it is all on one level. It can be all unpacked. You know, data compression is a wholeness that does reduce to the parts because you can mm -hmm. recreate the whole from the parts, right? Yes. But yes. What Wolfgang is talking about and what the world is, it's an irreducible wholeness. There's something else besides data in the seed. Yes. That uh -huh. is not, yeah. you know, compressing from the horizontal or corporeal elements, you know, that make up that seed. Yeah, I, loved, I loved what you were talking about when you were talking about <clears throat> the, the creation being um, matter and energy and information has to all be there at the beginning, except it's more than just information. I mean, I, information is a word of, of kind of uh, kind of a sterile word when we're thinking of what's really there. It's, it goes so far beyond information, but there's matter and energy. And then there is this, whatever it is that's beyond information. It's very hard to even have these conversations today because so much of our language is the language of science, yes. right? That we have to fit everything into their language, you know, matter, energy, information. These are limited concepts. They don't capture this idea of, you know, of being and of hierarchy and levels of being, right? So mm -hmm. this is this is a big part of our challenge today, you know, that this is hundreds of years of culture that have led us to where we are. Anybody who's been through the educational system learns these concepts and these words, right? And this language, and it's a limiting language with which to talk about, um, you know, it, it's, it's limited by design. Right, Wolfgang, you know, you often invoke Goethe, the quote, right, about in limitation, the master shows his, his power. And yeah. um, it's limited by design. And, and, and that's fine. It's good, right? But then to say that out of that limitation, <laughs> we're going to sort of recreate the unlimited, uh, that's, the, that's the fundamental and fatal error. Hmm. Couldn't agree more. Uh, and getting back for a moment to information theory, the whole point of information theory is to quantize information. Uh, and I'm not denying that information does have a quantitative side to it or aspect, but you lose everything, everything above the level of quantity that way. Uh, in other words, um, as always, modern science looks at the bottom of everything. And it is based upon the uh, metaphysical assumption, which is one of the worst errors ever conceived by the mind of man, is based upon the assumption that things evolve bottom up. This is why, for example, we believe in Darwinian evolution, when in fact, all the evidence is against it. I mean, I know of no theory which has been as abundantly falsified as Darwinism. All the facts speak against it, and yet this has no influence whatsoever on the academic community. It's a dogma, a dogma which they are not willing to give up. It, it, shows, it shows me that there is something behind modern science. There is something, well, to put it very, very plainly, uh, I do believe that there are not only good spiritual forces, there are also bad spiritual forces. And it is my conviction that uh, many of the modern dogmas of science are ideology driven from below. That makes it very serious. It's worse than an error. Error is a bad thing, but if an error comes from below and is ideology driven, then it is 
if you will, a counter religion. And this is where we stand today. As a civilization, we seem to have fallen prey to counter religion. Something one, like one of the one of the big problems with ideology of any kind is, and there's there's another thinker in this corner of the internet named John Verveke. He talks about um, things being reciprocally narrowing, and an ideology is like that. The, the the more complete and tight that the ideology becomes, the more that it narrows your focus, and then your narrow your focus just gets more and more narrow until all you're left with is this tiny little world that you inhabit because your ideology is so tight around you. And that can happen with political ideologies. It can also happen with scientific ideologies, right? Definitely. But it's also important to acknowledge what Wolfgang is saying here, that there is good and evil, right? Mm -hmm. That there are, and these aren't just, this, this isn't just, a couple of ideologies, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. reducing the conversation to ideology is again, kind of another um, crutch, if you will, to not have to really wrestle with the tough questions that we all have to ask ourselves and face today culturally, right? Which is this kind of reduction of everything, you know, to a relativism and a reductionism and, and kind of an avoidance of, well, <laughs> hey, if there is a God, right, what does that mean? And well, wouldn't you say, though, that the evil is not something out there? It's not some entity or, well, okay, let me, let me, let me ver verify that a little bit. But the evil resides in me just as much as it resides out there. I mean, I'm just as capable of evil as anybody is capable of evil. And then there is an entity who's obviously trying to drive us all towards more and more evil. So um, I, I think that sometimes we want to say, well, there's this idea out there and that idea is evil when a lot of it is our own, um, our own desire to believe something that's going to take us down a direction that we want to go and i think that's what happens in scientism is that um our desires can guide us along a path that leads us in the evil way but but it's because our evil desires are also connected up with that it's not like it's just that thing out there it's also me these are tough conversations yeah <laughs> right the main point that i just want to make is that again there's this language in common usage today you know where we're just comparing um you know i, I heard it the other day amongst a uh, a group of of stoics right talking about similar mm -hmm. themes right but then equating um uh human sacrifice in the aztec culture with christianity right these are just different ideologies Hmm. And that's a mistake, mm -hmm. right? And we have to, at a minimum, think about, you know, the ethics of our ideologies and not just say, oh, it's all, everybody's got an ideology, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's all human. It's, you know, it's kind of reducing it all to the level, again, you know, of not God, right? Not something from the center, not a creative force that's at the center that then creates everything and that ultimately we need to move closer to, right? Mm -hmm. So that language is just all over, you know, our culture today. And it's a very um, dehumanizing language, even though it sort of has the illusion that this is humanistic, if you will. Well, I, I think right? but I, when you I, deny... I can see what's happening here. And yeah. part of it is that, that, there are people who will call Christianity an ideology. Yes, absolutely. Right, right. As but Christianity is not Christianity is not an ideology because right. it, what I what defines an ideology is that it's it's an incomplete but very um, strictly boundaried set of ideas. But it's not the whole story. Yeah. Christianity is the whole story. <laughs> 
it is it is the whole story so mm -hmm. um christianity is not an ideology these other things like scientism and um certain Anything political ideologies ideology. are things that you can get trapped inside of because yeah. you're just mouthing the same routines over and over and over again and i think that may be what what wolfgang is talking about when he talks about scientism as an ideology people have this certain set of beliefs and they pass them back and forth amongst each other and then they just say them and then they all sound the same and it, and it sounds like that when you talk to people who are really deeply entrenched in scientism is that they are all mouthing the same thing over and over again these platitudes even even things that have been disproven but they they want to hold on to it and the same yeah. thing can happen I, in I Christianity agree with too, you. Right? Uh, officially science is supposed to be value free uh, when you are being introduced into to the uh, the basis of science that's one of the things you're told that we are we are value we're just basing ourselves on the facts uh, this is a lie it's a falsehood science is not value free there there is a telos a purpose behind it so that actually uh, science has ide an ideological basis. And when it claims to be value free, that is not the truth. And uh, the deeper you go into the into this subject of the foundations of science, the more you realize how decisively ideology plays into the equation plays into the into the picture so the the great catastrophe of contemporary western civilization resides in the fact that the educational system has been taken over almost lock stock and barrel by people of a given ideological bent and they will tell you, well, we are only interested in the truth and so on and so forth. But it is the truth as they see it. And heaven help you if you don't see it too. So there is a kind of a takeover of the educational system in the Western world by people of a basically atheistic uh, bent. And this is not a good thing. It's a very dangerous thing. And I'm, I'm reminded of the words of Christ when he said that the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Uh, I think there's a great deal of truth in that, that um, the people who are identified with that scientific religion, it is a religion of God. Uh, the people who are involved in that movement uh, are, in a sense, wiser than our the representatives of our churches and so on, because over the past 100 years, they have succeeded in taking over all the educational institutions, except a handful, uh, but all the uh, universities and uh, big publishing houses and so on, they have control of it. And this creates a great, great problem because we are losing our youth. Our youth, I mean, what chance does a 18-year-old uh, young man or young woman have to stand up against the professor of whatever it may be uh, I tell you that just as much as information, just as much as information is being uh, channeled into these young minds, disinformation also is, is going along the same channels and in a sense uh, may often prove to be the more powerful of the two. 
So this is a big, big problem. And I must say that the West has not been wise in the name of freedom and all these wonderful sounding things. They have, as it were, permitted uh, a certain segment of ideologists to take over the entire educational system. How this problem will be resolved, I have no idea, but it's a major problem and uh, it's not good. Well, on, on the hopeful front, there are a few universities starting up that are dedicated to going against the grain. So, so that's a good thing. That's a good thing, but... You mentioned an 18 year old starting college and in, uh, when you were 18, you were just finishing, weren't you? Yes, I was very, very eager to go to college as early as possible. And I graduated with my bachelor's degree when I was 18. Well, you, you graduated with three bachelor's degrees when you were 18. Yes, I majored in physics, mathematics and philosophy because I was sort of equally interested in all three. And then I, uh, I got a fellowship at the uh, School of Philosophy at Cornell. And I started in the fall uh, of the, the winter semester and I was going to get my doctorate in philosophy. And after three weeks of seeing the inside of it all, I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the chairman of the philosophy department and said, I have not yet touched any of this money. It's all yours. I'm going away. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be a lumberjack, which really was my intention. Luckily, my brother rescued me from that. And uh, three weeks later, I was back in the universities in the physics department. So I well, could never get away from the universities, although I've always been a fool of the universities because I realized that they are hotbeds of ideology and it is an ideology I detest. It's, it's not only that I am not comfortable with it, it's, it's in a sense the worst of all uh, uh, ideologies because one of the things that I experienced so deeply, I feel it is part of a human being to have reverence. There must be something that you, that the human being approaches with folded hands. If you don't know how to fold your hands, you're not human. And this is what the first thing that the universities drive out of you. Uh, you become uh, cynical, skeptical. You think you are so brilliant. When in fact, in a, metaphysically speaking, you are a moron, a completely literate. So the universities do inestimable damage. We send our children there to be formed. And what a catastrophe. They come out much worse than they were when they went in. And, Did you see that happening already when you were in college? Definitely. Wow. Definitely. And I rebelled against it. I, I hated it. I, I came from Europe, a conservative family in the German speaking world, and we were just trained differently. Uh, I mean, I came from a family, if you didn't uh, listen to good music, you were not cultured and nobody was even interested in talking to you. And, uh, I'm that way still. I mean, you, the important thing is to love what is beautiful, to believe in what is good and what is true, and to reject everything that is opposed to that. And when I entered the universities in this country, it's no better over there, incidentally, but that's where I got my education. I got it in this country. As soon as I entered the university, I realized that it was just the opposite way around. They were, for example, teaching relativism. Uh, I, I like Boogie Woogie, you like Beethoven. Uh, it's all the same. No, it is not. 
So culturally, I was a misfit in this country from the very beginning because I came with certain um, the old classical, mainly Germanic culture, and then the the spiritual. I mean, uh, not to think of something higher than the animal existence here on earth is to be subhuman. And I felt this and I felt our universities were making us subhuman. They were making these young people far worse than they were when they came into the university. Instead of strengthening their, uh, their higher instincts and aspirations, the university was trying to wipe them out as if this was something illusory and incompatible with Einstein's relativity or some ungodly thing. Uh, I was a foe of the universities all my life, and yet I couldn't get away from them. I spent my life in the universities, but I'll say this, I was in the universities, but I was never off the universities. I did my job and then I went home and read Plato or wrote books and told my life. It had nothing to do. I didn't even tell my colleagues at the university I was writing books. I knew they wouldn't understand what I'm saying. Uh, so I, uh, it, it was a strange relationship I had to the university's and higher education, but I consider it, if not the Achilles heel, it is one of the Achilles heels of our civilization. What what we do to the little ones, the, the least of these that that we're gonna we're gonna bear responsibility for. Yes, and in fact, I'm sorry to say this, I, I think many, many young people were much better when they entered the university than they are when they leave it. They may have had some uh, intuitive notion of something high and beautiful and uh, uh, worth approaching with folded hands. And by the time they come out of it, uh, they are cynical and uh, in a sense, believe in nothing at all. Well, it might actually be a good thing that so many young men are eschewing university now. We have a huge movement of young men away from the university. Yeah. And, uh, that may actually be a good thing for a generation anyway, to kind of clean house a little bit. But something has to be done to put good ideas in their head, to form them. Uh, I mean, this is one of the things that differentiates man from the animal. The animal has instincts. A young monkey knows exactly how to climb a tree and so on and get his bananas. He doesn't need to go to college. In the human world, it's different. We do need education. We do need formation. And by and large, that education, that formation has been disastrous. I mean, you can produce somebody who knows cyber technology and can work with computers and that's wonderful i admire it i have nothing against that but not at the cost of his most precious most sacred intuitions which are as it were rooted out from him by force uh, he, he thinks of his professors as, as wise people no wise people they are not in general they're not wise at all they have a technical competence in this, that, or the other. That's fine, but not at the cost of a fundamental indoctrination, which, uh, as it were, makes people profane. Uh, as I say, if you can't fold your hands, you're not a human being. Because fundamentally, what we need is gratitude and humility. To be open to what is above yes, us. Exactly. And this is why that scientific uh, education is so diabolical, because uh, instead of looking up, 
you think that everything comes from below, everything comes from particles and so on and so forth. I love physics and uh, I spend enough of my time studying it and also writing papers in it, but uh, not at the cost of what is sacred and what is truly human and worthy of the human. Well, I'm certainly thankful for all the books that you've written and all the study that you've done and for the heart that you have for that which is above. And, uh, and I wanna thank you also, Dr. Richard Smith for, for making this conversation possible. Um, this has just been so enriching and enlivening and uh, I'm gonna recommend all of your books and your foundation's website in my, in my notes and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity that I had to talk to both of you. Well, and I thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity too. I, I feel this is very good, very necessary, and please God, it'll do some good. Thank you, well, we'll put, we'll put that in his hands and see what he does with it. <laughs> I'm all for that. <laughs> Great. So very nice meeting you and all the best to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.